Good morning, afternoon or evening, depending on where in the world you are tuning in. I'm Max Hegblom, Editor-in-Chief of FEMS Microbiology Ecology, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this webinar on animal microbiomes. As we continue in various states of lockdown and distancing due to the global coronavirus pandemic, FEMS continues this series of webinars to support the microbiology community. These webinars provide a forum for the presentation and discussion of key research, enabling the flow of ideas to continue despite the cancellation of in-person events and conferences. FEMS journals are committed to publishing high quality scientific research that is accessible and shared across borders. FEMS journals invest in science. As a not-for-profit organization, FEMS, the Federation of European Microbiological Societies uses the income from our journals to fund our charitable activities and support our community, in particular, many early career scientists. We provide grants to hundreds of scientists every year and present several prestigious awards, organize and support conferences, and sponsor a range of events such as this webinar series. Note that if you missed our earlier webinars, they are available on the FEMS YouTube channel, so you can search for, for the links to this. Today, we focus on the fascinating topic of animal microbiomes with three excellent speakers covering microbiomes of dairy calves, hyenas, and the house mouse. Nilusha Malmutuga from Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, Connie Rojas from Michigan State University, and Julian Baer from the University of Zurich. Microbial communities living on or in animals affect the physiology and behavior of their hosts. So today we will hear more about the interplay between these animal microbiomes and the animals themselves. So it's my pleasure to welcome our three uh, uh, speakers. Nilusha, Connie, and Julian. And our uh, first speaker is Nilusha Malmutuge from Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, who's gonna talk about colostrum feeding, shaping the hindgut microbiota of dairy calves. So Nilusha, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Max. And thank you for this opportunity to present at the FEMS webinar today. And it's truly a great honor of mine. And I'm very excited to share what we have been doing in terms of classroom feeding and gut microbiome in dairy calves. Research on host microbial interactions has attracted um, tremendous attention in the recent years with omics-based research um, reporting the importance of microbiome on host health. And these effects can be found on the gut, respiratory tract, skin, all the way to brain affecting our behavior. Among this research, early life microbiome related research is at the center of attention. Due to the rapid changes that has been observed in the early life microbiome affecting the host health in the long term. Studies in various animal models, including human and livestock speech, species such as cattle has shown that the microbiome goes through rapid changes in terms of composition, diversity, and density due to various external and internal factors. These external and internal factors can be broadly categorized into prenatal factors and postnatal factors. Most of these factors can be controlled, but there are certain factors that are beyond our control. For example, in human birth mode, Antimicrobial usage can be determined based on the risk of a, uh, risk presence to the infants at birth. But if we think about the diet, which is one of the main thing that is interested in agriculture because it's something that we can easily control and influence the microbiome to create long-term influence on host health. Most of these factors you are seeing currently are generated based on human research but they are common to human and also livestock species. 
one of the amazing concepts evolved through this early life microbiome research is the window of opportunity that we have to intervene the microbiome establishment process and to create long-term changes in host biology and physiology. In human, it has reported as first thousand days of the life, but there's not so much about the cattle. And we speculate that would be the pre-weaned period in dairy cattle, where we are seeing rapid changes in the microbiome and also in the mucosal immune system. Before I move on, um, I'll, give, I'll talk a little bit about this diagram here. We are seeing the black solid arrows representing the normal microbial colonization process in human infants. And the dotted black lines arrow shows any disturbance, any perturbations in the microbiome with the factors that we discussed before. The green highlighted arrow showing us the time period we can create effective interventions to bring back a perturbed microbial population to normal microbial community composition by manipulating the factors that we discussed a minute ago. So let's move on to what we actually see um, in dairy cats. In dairy cats, due to the complex nature of the uterine environment with many, many layers between the dam and the fetus, we could see that there are no placental transfer of maternal antibodies or immunoglobulins during fetal stage. So that makes the cluster management such a crucial aspect in the industry especially in the dairy industry. With the extensive studies done um, in the past, we know that feeding these newborn cows with high quality colostrum within the first two hours provide sufficient maternal antibody transfer through passive transferring, and which is, this is enough, provide in sufficient immune protection during early life until the calves develop their own immune system and develop their own immune responses. So we know that classroom feeding is important in terms of passive transfer of immunity. But when we look at the classroom composition and compare it with the milk composition, we can see that there's so much more to the classroom other than the immunoglobulin that has been studied all through the past. It is a rich source of oligosaccharides, um, rich source of omega-6 omega fatty acids, immune cells, cytokines, and growth factors. There's so much more to learn about classroom and its impact on these newborn cats. So this actually leads to one of the work, works we did at the beginning to understand the effect of classroom feeding on gut colonization. This particular study had specific questions that we wanted to understand how it influenced the small intestine, the major site of mucosal immune system in dairy cats. So at that time, I was doing my PhD research, and my research focused on the importance of early life microbiome on gut development. And the, in this particular study, we compared a group of classroom deprived cows with cows fed fresh or heat treated classroom. Heat-treated classroom feeding has been well studied by Dr. Sandra Gordon at the University of Minnesota, and her group reported that use of 60 degrees centigrade for 60 minutes increased the absorption of immunoglobulin, and the calves fed with heat-treated classroom has lower diarrhea incidences than fresh classroom received calves. And we wanted to understand, okay, it's rich in oligosaccharide, what it could do to the gut microbial colonization. And we used a qPCR-based approach. When we look at the total bacterial density colonization, we can see that in the classroom deprived care, there was 100-fold lower bacterial density within the first 12 hours. And these numbers were similar to what we observed at birth which is represented by zero over here. A collaborative study done at the Children's Hospital of Boston and Harvard Medical School showed that if 
mice pups has 100 to 1000 fold lower bacterial density they produce significantly lower antibody responses to antigens following an immunization compared to normal mice pups with normal bacterial densities indicating that having normal bacterial densities since the early life is crucial for host to mount proper immune responses. So when we look at the colonization of beneficial bacterial group bifidobacterium, we could see that classroom feeding increased their colonization in the mucosal tissue attached environment, Heat treated classroom started to show significant impact since uh, six hours after feeding, but fresh, fresh classroom catching up to these numbers within the first 12 hours. When we look at the E. coli colonization, potential pathogens, or we call them opportunistic pathogens in the gut, we could see both classroom feeding group, fed groups had lower E. coli densities or E. coli proportions compared to classroom deprived calves. And these changes were significant in both mucosal tissue and digester associated communities. The study that I'm going to talk today um, look at the effect of classroom feeding on the hindgut or the colon microbial composition during first 12 hours. This was also done at the University of Alberta under the guidance of Dr. Lalu Guan, and three of us were PhD students. We had fun at the barn, but there were weeks of sleepless nights getting these calves right after birth, allocating them to treatments and sampling at six and 12 hours. So it is the same experimental design. The only difference is we are using colon samples, mucosal tissue and digester, and other than the qPCR approach, here we are using a 16S amplicon based sequencing to profile the whole bacterial community. I will first take you through the uh, data that we generated through qPCR. Um, based on our previous studies, we selected a group, couple of bacterial groups that we wanted to study. And we compared the proportions of these bacterial groups among the three classroom groups. And you can see when we use PCA-based visualization approach, the classroom deprived calves clustered apart from the classroom fed calves. And these changes were mainly driven by four bacterial groups, bifidobacterium, clostridium cluster 14A that includes butyrate producers, picalibacterium, one of the most abundant bacterial group in the calf hindgut, and E. coli. E. coli colonization decreased, but three other groups colonization increased with classroom feeding, regardless of which environment we are looking at. I will talk a little bit more about the bifidobacterium and E. coli colonization. Similar to the small intestine, we are seeing an increase in the bifidobacterium colonization, both mucosal tissue and digester environment. He treated classroom had the highest bifidobacterium colonization in the on the mucosal tissue environment. And the reason for seeing significant changes in the digester this time, perhaps due to the fermentation taking place in the hind gut. Uh, that is the major region in the intestine that perform uh, microbial fermentation of undigested digestive materials reaching the large intestine. And again, we are seeing a reduction in E. coli colonization in both lumen, the digester and mucosal communities. So we wanted to understand what is creating these changes we're seeing in the bifidobacterium population and E. coli in both small intestine, large intestine and large intestine, indicating that there's uh, somehow there's a huge effect of classroom feeding along the lower gastrointestinal tract. So first thing we wanted to rule out, we are not feeding them different bacteria densities through different classroom feeding. So we compared the density of bifidobacterium and E. coli in fresh and heat treated classroom. There were no detectable bacteria in these classroom samples we used. And then somehow we speculated 
Okay, there, are, there may be perhaps changes in the available nutrients for the bacterial groups that we are testing. Oligosaccharide, the major carbohydrate that is fermented by microbiota, is the favorite nutrients by bifidobacterium. So when we compared the oligosaccharide profiles in heat treated and fresh classroom, we could see heat treatment increased the oligosaccharides in classroom. Oligosaccharides are usually bound to the protein fraction and heat treatment we used perhaps release these oligosaccharides increasing their availability for bifidobacteria. So that's why we are seeing a bloom of bifidobacteria. And other thing oligosaccharide does is it can bind to E. coli cells and prevent E. coli from attaching to the epithelial cells. This actually uh, makes E. coli less competitive within the intestinal environment. So that's probably why we are seeing high bifidobacteria populations and lower E. coli populations in the small intestine and large intestine of the cows receiving heat treated plasma. When we look at the microbiome uh, bacterial profiles generated through, through 16S amplicon sequencing, we're not seeing such clustering effect we saw on the specific bacterial groups. This is largely due to the large number of shared operational taxonomic units or shared bacterial groups we observed among these treatments. However, when we compare, uh, when we perform pairwise comparisons to understand the effect of classroom feeding, we could see heat treatment decrease enterococcus at six hours, Escherichia shigella at 12 hours, compared to the classroom deprived cats. So again, there were no significant differences between the heat treated versus fresh classroom or the fresh classroom versus classroom deprived, which again makes sense for not seeing a cluster based on the bacterial turbinity composition. So this suggests before, uh, the feeding classroom might not be affecting the whole microbiome. Instead, it has specific bacterial groups that it works on in, by increasing or decreasing the colonization. So looking at the same management practice and questioning it with a different angle, now we know Colostrum feeding has so much other beneficial effects. It is not all about passive transfer of immunity, although that is the main point of feeding colostrum. Based on what we did, we know that feeding colostrum is important to promote colonization of beneficial microbiota and the changes in the early gut microbiome could be important for improved gut health, which is another reason for decreased diarrhea that has observed by Dr. Sandra Gordon and her group. And we know that um, feeding heat-treated colostrum enhances the bifidogenic effects or the prebiotic effects of colostrum. And that's why we are seeing quick and drastic changes in the colonization of bifidobacterium with heat-treated colostrum. But before we recommend heat-treated classroom as a routine management practice to the industry, there's so much more to understand. This is all about the short-term impacts of classroom feeding. What happens through the neonatal period? Will these changes continue? If not, how can we continue these uh, beneficial gut microbiome changes throughout the neonatal period? Are the uh, questions that we still need to answer in the future. So with this, I would like to thank the amazing group behind this uh, work who spent sleepless night at the DRTC, Dairy Research and Technology Center at the University of Alberta, and also all the funding agencies that supported the research program and my career. Thank you. Thank you so much. Re really nice talk. I have several questions for you, but just for everybody else, we will save the uh, Q&A till the end of the session. So uh, any questions you have, please type them in through the uh, question link and we will then sort through them at the end after all the three speakers. So thank you. We'll continue with a very different animal and a very different question. 
Our next speaker, uh, Connie Rojas from Michigan State University is gonna talk about the microbiomes of wild-spotted hyenas. Connie. Thank you, Max. All right, just getting this set up. Um, all right, hello everyone. Thank you so much for coming to my talk today on body site specific microbiota in among juvenile and adult wild spotted hyenas. My name is Connie Rojas and I'm a PhD candidate at Michigan State University in the Ecology, Evolution and Behavior program. So we know that host associated microbial communities, also known as the, micro, as the microbiota, can influence their host phenotype. Just a moment. Can influence their host uh, phenotype in giant anteaters Resident gut microbes can degrade the kind exoskeletons of consumed insects and thus can optimize their host protein nutritional intake. In little brown bats, bacteria isolated from the skin show antifungal effects against the pathogen that causes white nose syndrome. In forest musk deer, bacteria from the musk gland are, are hypothesized to secrete some of the components of musk, which is a male pheromone. And in mice, changes in the gut microbiota are often associated with changes in depressive and anxiety-like behaviors, as well as memory and aggression. Um, thus, determining which host variables are associated with variation in the microbiota is a key line of inquiry in this field. Um, and so quite a lot, the field of micro, of the microbiome field has grown quite a lot in the five years that I've been studying this for my PhD, we know that a lot of host factors can predict the microbiota in wild mammals. We know, for example, that phytogenetic relatedness is one of the strong determinants, as we see that host species that are more closely related tend to have more similar microbial communities. The same thing goes with diet, as is seen in humans and many other systems, that small or large changes in diet are all usually accompanied by changes in the microbiota. And the microbiota also varies with habitat, season, and altitude, and is sensitive to the host social relationships, um, such as that social group and, and social interactions can predict the composition of these bacterial communities. However, there's a need to study additional host and ecological factors that haven't been studied so thus far. And also there's been a heavy focus on the gut microbiota because of its feasibility and its sort of importance for host health and function, but there's also, right, there's a sort of a gap here in knowledge that we should also be looking at other body sites and also studying carnivores, or other socially complex mammals, especially in the wild. So that is where my research comes in. I'm proposing to use spotted hyenas as a system for which we can study the microbiome in a wild mammal. Spotted hyenas are large social carnivores that live in mixed sex groups called clans. These clans contain overlapping generations of females and their offspring, along with immigrant males that are born elsewhere, and their groups can contain over 90 individuals. And their societies are structured by strict linear dominance hierarchies, in which an individual's position in the hierarchy determines its priority of access to resources. For example, in this image, these three hyenas are likely higher ranking than the hyena in the back that's just kind of waiting for them to finish and leave any scraps behind. And as you can imagine, these have long-term fitness consequences for individuals. Um, their societies are also matrilineal uh, and exhibit female dominance. So for example, here's uh, uh, one of the hierarchies in one of our clans, which we have number one, the highest ranking hyena, all the way to 29, the lowest ranking hyena. And at the top of a hierarchy, you have all the adult females from the various matrilines. And at the bottom of the hierarchy, you have the immigrant adult males that are coming from other clans. And unlike what is observed in other social mammalian societies, rank in hyena societies is obtained by a maternal rank inheritance. And we use this term loosely just to mean that offspring inherit the rank just below that of their mothers. So in this cartoon here, for example, you can have four sisters, four hyena sisters, but as each but as the top ranking hyena keeps having more and more offspring, their rank keeps declining because the, the offspring sort of are, are gonna be above them. So you can see how for many generations, these ranks are fixed and are sort of passed on and with hardly any change. 
Um, the hyenas that we study reside in the open grasslands in the Maasai Mara National Reserve in Kenya, which is uh, which contains two dry seasons and two rainy seasons, and is home to uh, the annual wildebeest and zebra migration that come from the Serengeti ecosystem in Tanzania. And our particular research group, uh, Dr. Kay Holkamp's Maasai uh, Mara Hyena project has been conducting behavioral and ecological research on these populations of spotted hyenas since 1988. So we have a really great data set for asking long-term questions and especially have all these samples that would otherwise take me the entire duration of my PhD to collect, but it's nice that we have them in the freezers so I can start analyzing them immediately. Um, so for this study, I was interested in investigating which factors are shaping the microbiota of wild spotted hyenas. I wanted to determine whether body site specificity of the microbiota is observed in adult and juvenile hyenas, and to also evaluate whether the microbiota at one or more body sites varies with host traits, including age, sex, and social rank. So for this data set, we have bacterial swabs from six body sites in juvenile and adult hyenas. We have um, swabs from the ears, the nose, the mouth, prepus, sang gland, and the rectum. And for juveniles, we have 13 juvenile females and 11 males, all from one social group that were collected from 2012 to 2014. And their ages range from 11 to 21 months. And uh, for this group, we're going to be able to evaluate the sex differences since we have uh, individuals from both sexes. And then for adults, we have 12 uh, female hyenas from three social groups, also collected from 2012 to 2014 and their ages range from three to seven years. And we're gonna be able to use this data set to compare the age. So we're gonna compare juvenile females to adult females to see if there is a difference between the age classes. Uh, and just a little bit of a hyena development, just so we know where both of these groups were at. Uh, hyenas are born and then they get transferred to a communal den with all the other baby hyenas and where they stay and are taken care of for the first 10 months of life. After this period of time, they reach independence and they graduate from their communal dens into the real world and they begin to eat meat and are weaned at around 12 to 18 months. Uh, they reach adulthood around 24 months, but reproduction is often delayed and then they can live up to 18 years in the wild. So they live pretty long. Um, I won't go too much into the methods, but I basically use 16S or RNA gene sequencing for profiling the microbiota. And 16S RNA gene is a phylogenetic marker gene that allows you to assay the sort of bacterial taxa that are present in your sample. And after processing the sequences, I conducted all statistical and descriptive analyses in the R statistical program. Um, and then just a little bit about the stat that I did for to illustrate microbiota composition, I built stacked bar plots of bacterial taxa abundances for alpha diversity analyses. I built linear mixed models where I basically had a Y being alpha diversity metric and then body site sex, sample ID, and hyena identity as predictor variables. And for beta diversity analyses, I use permutational multivariate uh, analyses of variance and mental tests that were uh, that use break Curtis distance matrices. Um, so for first results, we were seeing that the microbiota is indeed uh, body site specific and that each body site has a very different community. Shown here are stacked bar plots showing the, the relative abundance of bacterial families in, in each body site and each color represents a bacterial family. And we're seeing, for example, that the nasal cavity is heavily dominated by bacteria like Moraxillaceae, which constitutes over 51% of the community. And we're seeing that this is fairly typical of many mammalian nose microbe communities. Um, the oral communities are have really significant abundances of Leptotrichiaceae, Pasteurulaceae, and Porphyromonidaceae. And again, these are also communities that are present in other mammals. Um, the prepus, rectum, and sanguine communities are 
all very similar in composition and are dominated by cluster jellies, Perini bacteriaceae, and classified clostridia. And these have been found in the urogenital Euro reproductive tract, skin, and sanguine communities of other mammals. The era was a little bit particular in that it had mostly taxa that were not found in any other body site. That's why they're not showing up in this plot here. Um, um, I'll Here's about two sides. So, one that happened. so yes, that's why they're not showing up on the study plot because they're they're really unique to this particular body site. Um, so that was the communities for the adult female hyenas, and the juveniles show very similar patterns in that right the all the body sites have their own characteristic unique communities dominated by similar bacterial taxa. When we're looking at the alpha diversity of the communities. We're seeing that the ear, oral, and rectal microbiota were highly diverse compared to the, the prepas, the sand gland, and the nasal cavity. And we we could only like speculate as to why we're thinking that because the hyenas are eating carcass and their ear, their whole face is often immersed in the carcass, it could sort of facilitate colonization by all these like carcass microbes, um, the oral and rectal communities can reflect the hyena's very diet. We know that hyenas eat basically all of the animal, including the bone and all the insides and skin. So this could also build a nice ecosystem for the microbes. Um, and then it's, we're seeing that the uh, preppers and the sanguine communities are, are sebaceous, and we know that sebaceous skin sites are often also not particularly diverse. Um, and then when we're looking at beta diversity and looking at how these communities map onto an ordination space, uh, shown here as a principal coordinates analysis plot, we're seeing that the communities also partition by body site. Um, in our particular sample, uh, body site ex explained quite a significant amount of variation in the microbiota. And here in adults, we're seeing that the each body site forms its unique cluster, right? We have all the body sites here color coded, and they all show a significant clustering. We are seeing that the nasal communities are highly heterogeneous among individuals, which is why they show this sort of large spread in the ordination. In juveniles, we're seeing similar patterns, except that there's significant overlap between the ears and the preppers microbiota. They're not as sort of clearly separated like they are in adults. Um, and then when we're looking at the host traits, remember that was part two of this question, evaluating whether particular host traits could predict variation in microbiota, we found that host sex explained 10% of the variation in, in, in the same gland, in microbiota in particular. So when we're looking at uh, at this ordination, uh, females, female, juvenile, female hyenas are color coded as orange, the males as green. We're seeing some sort of a separation, not as clearly defined, but there's still a separation nonetheless. And it was detected to be statistically significant and explained again 10% of the variation. Age class, or right when we're comparing the microbiota of juvenile females to those of adult females, we're also seeing. Uh, that they that these that this host factor explain up to 15% of the variation in the mic in the microbiota, particularly in the preface and in the rectum. And here again we're seeing more clear clustering of the two communities. And I forgot to mention, but in uh, in the in the literature it's hypothesized that sex differences in physiology and hormones and behavior could account for some of the variation that is observed in the microbiota between the sexes. And in terms of age class, there's also a large body of literature that shows that the micro, microbiota changes as one ages due to changes in physiology or diet or health. There's a lot of just changes that happen as one gets older. And in hyenas, uh, we also found that hyena identity explained 12% of the variation. 
And however, social rank is not a significant predictor of, of the microbiota at any body site. And we, we believe this might be the case because hyenas were barely learning their rank when we surveyed their microbial communities. They, hyenas typically don't assume their position in the hierarchy until they are at least 18 months of age. So a lot of the hyenas in our sample were still sort of fair now where they fall in the hierarchy with help from their family to help to sort of guide them to who, who they're more dominant to, who they're more submissive to. And as you can imagine, this is a complicated process because if there's over 90 individuals in the clan and you're just a young hyena, it, it takes a lot to learn. Um, so uh, to wrap up, I, we found uh, that the distinct chemistry and nutrient gradients at each body site are likely filtering specific for specific microbes, which is why we're seeing that these communities are very distinct among the body sites. It's probably due to sort of the physiology and the sort of chemistry at that, of those particular body sites. Um, the microbiota profiles at each body site resemble those of other carnivores or scent producing mammals. Um, and that behavioral and physiological differences between the sexes or age classes may underlie differences in their microbiota profiles. And then lastly, that we saw no observed effect of social rank on the microbiota of juvenile hyenas since they were in the process of learning their ranks. And in the future, I would study this question in adult female hyenas that have already assumed their upper rank in the hierarchy. And that is actually my other dissertation project that is currently being written up right now. Uh, I would like to thank the Mara Hyena Project, Human Wildlife Ser Service, Tag University, Masai Mara University, the Beacon Center, NSF, and Michigan State University for making this research possible. And I know I'll take questions at the end. I also like to put a shameless plug for a another uh, manuscript that I just wrote on host uh, phylogeny, host ecology, structure the mammalian gut microbiota at different taxonomic scales. It should be on viral archive very soon. And it basically investigates whether like the relative influences of host phylogeny and host ecology in structuring the microbiota of 11 species of St. Patrick African mega herbivores that are also residing in the same area that other hyenas live in. And with that, I'll end my presentation. Okay, thank you very much. Again, we'll save our questions until till the end and continue on our uh, series. So our next speaker is Julian Burr from uh, University of Zurich. And we will go to the house mouse and look at the intestinal microbiota as it's affected by environmental transitions. So Julian, I see you have your slides up, so it's all yours. Great, thanks a lot, Max, for the introduction and thanks FEMS Microbiology Ecology for organizing these webinars, very cool thing. Um, yeah, now that we talked about uh, domestic animals and uh, very wild animal, these hyenas, we come back to what is probably the most known animal in science, it's the, the conventional mus musculus lab mice. Uh, I'm going to talk about a paper that was recently published in FEMS Microbiology Ecology, where we investigated how the bacterial intestinal microbiota responded to environmental transitions of the host themselves. And to start, I want to quickly talk a bit how uh, we can do research on different types of levels. So let me quickly change the pointer. Um, so. A researcher can do his research in an in vitro study where the entire environment is completely controlled by the researcher themselves. Then we can do research in lab animals where still the, the environment of the host, the, the mouse, is controlled by the researcher. Then there's these uh, studies that we just heard about where basically the environment and the genotype is uncontrolled by the researcher. Uh, of wild populations of animals. And then the last part is basically then the translation to, to humans. And um, the usual way of how we develop, for example, drugs for clinical trials is going from in vitro studies to lab animals 
and then directly to the human population. And this whole part of the wild animals is kind of left out. And uh, there's multiple studies showing that this could, might, could be actually a problem, that we miss some part. Uh, to illustrate that, I want to show a figure from a PNS paper from 2013, where the author investigated the conservation and the divergence between transcriptional programs uh, in, in mice and men. So on the x-axis, we see the gene expression uh, of humans and on the y-axis for mice. Uh, and what they showed is that even though the immune system is very similar, I mean, both species or mammals, both have an adaptive immune systems. Um, there are certain genes upon a stimulation here for isolated CD4 positive T cells uh, stimulated by CD3, uh, I think, um, that there are differences in the transcriptional response to this stimulation. Certain genes were only upregulated in uh, humans, but not in mice here, the, the red ones. Uh, certain were only upregulated in mice, but not in men. And with that, uh, it's basically just one of the examples why mice and men are not the same. And this has some implications for the translation of the animal model into the human system. Uh, that's a quote from the abstract from a review in the American Journal of Translational Research from 2014, uh, where the authors state that even though animal models are basically essential, not only in cancer, but basically in most research areas, the average rate of the successful translation from an animal to a clinical cancer trial is less than 8%. So this is very low. And uh, so there's many research do ongoing at the moment uh, to investigate why the, this translation rate is so low and how it could be improved. And one of the angles is, of course, the microbiota. We're talking about microbiota today. Um, and a way, uh, one reasoning is that the microbiota of these lab mice is very distinct from what they would have been in the wild. And the wild population might be more similar to the human population. And uh, here's an example and figure from a 2017 per paper from Cell by Rossard and colleagues, where they investigated the microbiota of wild and lab animals, uh, here showing two principal component analysis plots on unweighted and weighted unifrac distances. And we clearly see that all the wild animals in green cluster quite far apart from the lab animals in blue. And when they looked a bit in deeper to check what make actually these differences. Already on the phylum level, there seems to be very strong differences of an overrepresentation of firmicutes in the lab animals and an underrepresentation or basically complete absence of proteobacterial species in these lab animals. So there are approaches how one can make the, the microbiota of lab animals a bit more resembling the natural microbiota and therefore trying to improve uh, the predictive ability of these animal models. So the most famous, I would say, two approaches are called the dirty mouse and the natural microbiota approaches, where a dirty mouse basically means bringing the dirt from the wild animal into the lab and expose the lab animal to this dirt to promote um, the microbiota, intestinal microbiota, but also skin, of course, and other sites to change and therefore induce changes in, for example, the immune system. Um, so it's usually done by, for example, uh, cohabiting um, pet store animals or wild captured animals together with the lab animals. And another approach is this natural microbiota where uh, it's supposed, uh, suggested to collect the microbiota isolated from a wild animal, pathogen free, of course, so to have no pathogens introduced and then graft this microbiota into the lab animal. And this uh, it was shown to be very effective. And here with this project, I want to show a third approach that was uh, developed in Andrea Graham's lab, the PI of this paper. 
uh, which is basically termed rewilding, where we're not bringing the dirt to the mouse, but the mouse to the dirt. So we took conventional lab animals, C5775 PL6 mice, um, and transferred them to an outdoor enclosure where they were exposed to uh, rain, temperature changes, light changes, uh, were able to forage on plants and insects. Um, so basically everything that a wild animal would have been exposed to, apart from predators, we protected the animals from predators, of course. Uh, we included an in-between step uh, where we increased the temperature uh, for the mice over a duration of a couple of days to um, prepare the mice to the temperature and humidity range expected that these mice will be exposed to uh, outdoors. And on a control group, we had a group of mice that remained in the standard animal facility conditions for the entirety of the time. And I must say these lab animal mice were probably the happiest in a couple hundred generations, if not thousands. They were able to live in these outdoor enclosures for 10 days and uh, interact with these very interesting environment. Um, on a side note, we also infected half of the mice with Trichuris muris, which is a, an intestinal nematode, uh, very closely to related to Trichuris trifura, which is the human counterpart um, of a direct fecal-oral infection uh, transmission route. I um, will not focus on this part in the talk a lot, but just so you know, this is also part of the study design. So we uh, got 48 mice. Um, we kept them in the standard animal facility conditions for a couple of days. And then five days before we infected the animals, we collected the first fecal sample uh, called baseline um, for then following 16S or RNA sequencing to, for all these microbiota uh, investigations. Um, then mice got uh, transferred to this acclimation room where the temperature was increased one day later. So this basically 14 out of each of the infection groups uh, were then assigned to this transfer group. Uh, they stayed inside this transfer, this acclimation facility for a couple of days during which we collected three more fecal samples. Of course, also from the constant group remaining in the, the constant animal facility uh, conditions at the same time. Then 18 days after infection, mice were transferred to the outdoor enclosure. Four days later, the first outdoor time point sampling. And then after 10 days outdoors, the last uh, sample was collected. So what we found is, well, first look at, uh, let's look at the alpha diversity, so the within sample diversity, higher values meaning more different species, and uh, here with the Shannon index, also more homogeneous distribution of the number of individuals per species. Uh, top panels are for this and the next figure showing the constant group, bottom group for the transfer group, left side infected, right side left side uninfected, right side infected. And as expected, there was basically no change over time um, in the diversity for the animals that stayed inside these animal facility conditions. Uh, so colors are basically the time points we sampled. And when we here focus on the in uninfected transfer animals, uh, where we observed a gradual increase of the diversity during this acclimation phase while the temperature was increased, slight drop after transfer to the outdoors enclosure, and the highest diversity when they were outdoors for 10 days. For the infected animals, we didn't see basically no trend for uh, regarding temperature effects, but again, highest diversities after they have been outside for 10 days. What is actually more interesting uh, to look at is the, the community composition. So this is a figure showing uh, principal component analysis on weighted unifrac distance. And uh, the closer together two points are, the more similar is the community composition. Again, as expected, the constant group samples, they basically cluster all together. There's no, no 
divergence between the samples. But again, again, if we look at the uninfected transfer group mice, we see a divergence along the second uh, dimension of this plot. Uh, and these dark red samples, uh, they cluster not far apart, but distinct from the baseline samples in, in gray here. And the transfer to the outdoors is mainly uh, accredited to four on the first axis. And the latest outdoor sampling time point is quite far off and quite distinct from all these uh, indoors animal facility samples here. Again, when we look at the infected samples, there's not such a clear trend. The uh, intergroup or intra-group variability seems to be a bit higher and there's not so clear differences. <coughs> so we then we want to identify which bacterial species or uh, not species on a family level here um, are driving these changes during these different environmental stages. Um, we identified uh, with an ALDEX2 approach 14 families with very distinct response patterns. So let me quickly explain this figure. We calculated the average relative um, abundance per sample sampling time point for the transfer group animals only, and then calculated the difference between the average at the end of acclimation A and the baseline for uninfected and infected animals. Uh, same we did for the end of outdoors and the end of acclimation phase. Then uh, this is scaled so we can do a same uh, same scale so we can have a, an even color gradient for yellow, no change in this uh, difference, blue a loss and red a gain of the species. Um, and there's distinct patterns that we see here. For example, certain species respond with a, an increase during increasing temperature and then a decrease afterwards. There's certain species where we see clear differences between the uninfected and infected. Here, for example, for Porphyra monadacea, we see a decrease during the acclimation phase, which is quite strong in the uninfected animals, but not in the infected animals, and then no real change after we transfer outdoors. Uh, then I want to point out here the the Enterobacteria sea and the Prevotelacea, which both were not present at all. That's why it's just yellow um, in, in any of the lab animals, but they were able to colonize or, or make a foothold in the microbiota of, the, uh, um, of these mice after transferring outdoors. So probably they were sampled from the environment. Same for the Prevotelacea, which were only present in uninfected animal samples. And that's probably the uh, more familiar type of plot for these types of compositional data analysis. So the stacked bar, bar plots, where we see uh, how the communities change over time. Uh, so we see here, again, a decrease of the Porphyra monadacea in the transfer un uninfected transfer animals, and not much change in these uh, family in the infected animals. Here pop up these two red ones, or the Prevotelacea, which were only present in these samples. There's the Clostridia salis, uh, Clostridia saeus family that was basically lost completely after transfer outdoors. And this is basically a figure to show you that we observe very, very complex dynamics that are difficult to explain and probably interact a lot with each other. So, to conclude this study, basically, we, we see that abiotic, like the temperature change and the biotic environment, like the exposure to the dirt outdoors, have, has an influence on the intestinal bacterial microbiota. And that this rewilding of lab mice is a potential method to improve, again, the translational power of the mouse model. I'm pretty sure that certain uh, standard infection model, for example, could well be done also in such a rewilding setting. Then to put this in a bit of perspective, I want to introduce the concept of thermoneutrality, which was actually not familiar to myself when conducting this research. 
thermal neutrality defines the temperature range in which a bacterial or, or an organism doesn't need to expend any energy to conserve its body temperature. So it's not freezing and it's not sweating. And the problem is that 20 degrees Celsius, which is the regular room temperature in these animal facilities, is the thermal neutrality point of a clothed human, but not of a mice. There's various research that has shown that around 30 degrees or even a bit higher is the optimum temperature for mice. And uh, this figure uh, is from a review in Transient Cancer from 2016, where the authors summarize different areas where it is known that the, the ambient temperature of housing a mice has an impact on the outcome of any kind of research. So there's immune stuff that is influenced metabolism, physiology, and other things. And uh, we see that already the microbiota is affected by that. So I would suggest, or we suggest that the microbiota might be one of the ways of how um, the, these differences could be conveyed. Um, and the last point I want to make here is that uh, I didn't talk a lot about, or basically not at all, about this nematode infection part, mainly because there's another paper that was historically actually a follow-up, but publication-wise it was published previously uh, that investigate this part a lot more in depth. And uh, where my shared first author colleague, Jackie Loing, what must be able to show that on the timing on which when the mice were infected with the nematode, so basically either infect them while they're still in the lab and then transferring them outdoors or infecting them when they're already outdoors has an influence on the worm burden. So there are more worms in mice that were already outdoors or uh, were transferred outdoors compared with lab animals that basically exposed all worms and the per worm biomass was increased drastically for mice that were infected while they're already outdoors. So there's again a re uh, another sign that the environment has a profound impact on various uh, aspects of, of the microbiota and then also the immunology and infection outcomes here for example. So I basically have three take-home methods that, again, the intestinal microbiota can respond to changes of abiotic and biotic environments. And uh, the controlling for these abiotic factors uh, might be actually beneficial when one wants to compare wild and lab animals. And that is trichuris muris infection can modulate the microbiota response to environmental transfers. Um, with that, I want to thank the amazing team, especially my shared first co-author, Jackie Loing, who was responsible for conducting most of the field research at the uh, outdoor enclosure, and Andrea Graham for her amazing guidance in this project. So thanks a lot for your attention, and with that, I'm done with my talk. Thank you very much. Julian, uh, really interesting and fun to see, again, the changing conditions of, of housing a mouse model and the effects on that. Uh, we're going to open this up to uh, questions on all of the three talks. Uh, just before that, in addition to thanking the three of you, I want to thank both uh, Sarah McKenna and Joe Shuttleworth, uh, staff at o OUP and FEMS, who are in the wings, making sure that everything is, is working, rightly so. Again, that's been important to make sure that these webinars actually function. And uh, I thank them for all of their work behind the scenes. As So again, I'm going to look through the questions that are coming in here, but before that, I want to throw out one question, and that comes from a comment that, Neil, you brought up early on uh, in your introduction, that there's a time window when you can shape the early micro gut microbiota. And that may basically then uh, trigger it or, or would be very stable, and what you do early on is going to influence late stages. 
Well, Julia, you just showed that no, you can drastically change the gut microbiota by changing the environmental parameters for where the animal is living. So can you, and, and again, Connie, you're showing also that the juvenile uh, and then the older hyenas had fa actually fairly stable communities in the different body parts. Can you square this? I mean, what's, what, does it make a difference on what we're studying, what model system, or wh when does an early intervention really set you up for life versus where can major changes actually completely re reset your microbiome? I mean, like, the body site that we're like, examining, right, should be a big one that we first consider, like the gut, it's highly sensitive to ex the external environment at any point in, in life, right? And it, like it's been shown in research, like early life gut communities can do impact long-term and, and we know that it changes with age. But like, for example, like in the hyenas, the sang gland communities and the other body sites, they, these may be more stable, more robust, to sort of environmental change and so I, yeah first thing is like considering like which body cell you're looking at and then for example in our hyenas i would say that rank rank should be like one of the big determinants of like how a, a hyena's microbiome looks like especially the gut and and how that's going to affect its health later in life since social rank and fitness are like strongly tied and and we know that rank sort of is kind of changes a lot early on, but then it's pretty much where you are for the rest of your life. Um, so yeah, also, I guess, yeah, the systems matter, the age matters, the environment matters. Yeah, and I would say that as Nilusha showed that diet is actually one of the major determinants, at least of the, the gut microbiota, which I was studying the most. Um, there's some studies showing in humans, for example, that uh, at major life stage events like switching from breastfeeding to more solid foods for example has very profound impacts on the microbiota composition and i think maybe in in the hyenas the, the switch from weaning to to the later meat food is a major determinant and here in the study i showed is basically the switching to the outdoors world well they were able to forage on plant and uh, other studies in the system have already shown that uh, the, the mice they eat a lot of different plants outdoors even though they're actually able to also eat mouse chow in in our system so it's it's very much diet induced that would be my guess in, a, in their behavior and their exercise how much they have move around indoors versus uh, in the outdoor system? Definitely. Um, I haven't uh, tracked any data on that, but uh, there were multiple studies in this system now. And uh, yes, there's differences in, in exercise. And what was mainly tracked was uh, the amount of burrows, for example, that the mice dig in the, the ground. And that's something that they even though these mice haven't been able to do that in the lab for generations, they <clears throat> pick up immediately. Uh, they interact a lot more with each other because there's also more mice uh, within one of these enclosures. And yeah, yeah, they eat different foods mainly. <laughs> yeah, Neely, what do you think about that early shift or, or importance for with colostrum? You're muted. <laughs> no. Okay, thank you. Yeah, but actually the thing is it depends on uh, what we are looking at. If the change to the, uh, the uh, host, the change host experiencing is drastic, there will be an opportunity um, for us to intervene due to the drastic changes in the microbiome. But the early life is, so specific because it's it's going through that natural unstable stage that there's so much space for us to intervene um, and then it's it's not just one thing in 
affecting the early life microbiome. There are so many different things affecting during the early life. So that's why this period is so interesting. But the main thing is we have to think about that in terms of which species, animal species we are looking at and what factors we are trying to um, control through these interventions. Um, for example, even in cattle, um, we talk about this early life, but in beef cattle, um, we have abrupt weaning after six months staying with their dams. And that's such a strong impact on these calves. And it gives another nice window of opportunity with the unstable microbiome to create some intervention and influence the um, host health. So there's a question on the um, practicality of this. So how common is the colostrum feeding of calves in rural areas? And would farmers have the resources for giving this heat treatment to colostrum? Okay, so heat treatment, um, it has been ada already adapting in the uh, United States in large dairies. So that's a huge investment for the uh, farmers. And the other thing is, with one degree variation in the temperature, which is very crucial, we can destroy immunoglobulins instead of increasing the passive transfer. So that's why um, it's probably not ad well adapted in the industry, um, except for the large dairies that are practicing it already. In rural areas, they're still relying on the dams to uh, provide colostrum. So that's why we are seeing um, Passive, failure of passive transfer of immunity in dairy industry is so much high, even uh, we have so much understanding about how important colostrum feeding. So before we go and tell the farmers to include it as a routine management practices, there are certain things like how we control the temperature and what this investment going to make, how it going to make them a profit, because that's something industry always concerned by the pasteurization. Um, tank and then using it uh, regularly in a small dairy might not be that practical compared to a da da large dairy where they have so much extra classroom that they store. So if they're storing, it's easy for them to heat pressurize this and store. So it's a practicality can be varied depending on where we're looking at. Okay. And then there's a question on hyenas. So is the microbiota involved in their health status and is this observable between different social groups? So we like, can't directly test sort of fitness or any, say anything like this causes this is we're kind of limited by our sampling, heavily limited by what we have. I mean, I, I would imagine so because it is so it's something that's observed in many other mammalian systems and to, especially with like rank. So I would say it it is, it does, should affect its health and fitness. Um, yeah, there's not much, I haven't really like directly tested. It's really hard to okay. directly test. But. but there's a second question on uh, hyena physiology. So do hyenas dump their body heat through the ears on the grasslands rather than excessive panting? And could this be explaining the microbiome differences, why the ears are so different than the other body parts? I, that is a great question. I, yeah, I would, I would say so because I mean their ears are quite large and they are sort of thick and so I, I, I'm going to look into the panting because I don't know, if, I don't actually think they pant, but that, I'm gonna write this down because that, that would be yeah. good. Because we have no idea. We're like, why are the weirds so weird? Um, so that could. Thank you for that. Yeah, you'd think. I mean, you mentioned that it was one of uh, a lot of the carcass microbiota mm -hmm. getting in there. But have, have, do you have any samples of their food to show is that actually an inoculum? We they are. We have them. They're stuck in Kenya because there were some. Okay. But but once they get them, I, I should I should. <laughs> okay, that'll be interesting. I also see. have a related question if I can jump in. Sure. Um, so you showed that the ears are very different for from the oral microbiota, if I remember correctly. 
Um, so I don't know, do hyena clean themselves? So I guess you said they stick their head in the carcass so they're full of blood. So they probably clean themselves by, by licking. So I would have kind of expected the oral be more close to the ear. Right, because they are eating things. I mean, they get into the water a lot. They're in mud a lot. Okay. They're in dirt a lot. <laughs> the wax is really, there's a lot of wax in there. Mm. Um, so maybe, but I agree with you, right? Why aren't the, weird, the ears? So maybe it's not the question. <laughs> okay, there are also health concerns about demise. Uh, so a question of whether the uh, health changes with the, uh, their changing habitat. And then the other is the absolute temperature. So that has such a large effects on the mice. So what, so here in the labs, you have a constant temperature versus in nature, there's a large temperature ex extreme day and night cycles and so on. Is that something that has been studied and do you know about addressing this question? Yeah, um, so the first one is a bit easier to answer because we actually tried to measure that. So, uh, Monitoring the, the weight of mice is the, the basic measure of, of uh, how healthy these mice are. And we saw a very slight increase during this increase of temperature in the, the weight of mice, and then <coughs> actually quite a drastic drop of the weight of the mice after they were transferred outdoors of, um, at the very first sampling time point outdoors. But then on the second, it started to increase and Later studies in the same systems showed that if the mice resided outdoors for uh, two to three weeks, the, the weight is basically rebounding to the same levels as in the lab. So uh, what is suggested is that this transfer outdoors is actually quite a shock and induces a lot of stress. So they lose weight very rapidly, but uh, then they adapt to the new environment and get hold of how to, to navigate it and what to eat and then become happy again. And then the second on the, the fluctuation of the temperature is a good one for which I don't have a clear answer. I would need to look a bit more into the, the literature, but there's studies suggesting that actually there's differences in, in the thermal optimum depending on, of course, the activity level and mice are mainly active at the dusk and dawn, so the, where the temperature is usually uh, similar or quite low in most regions. Um, and so there's probably an influence of that as well. So one of the, the ways to test it would basically be to induce such a temperature and light cycle that is correlating more with the nature. But I don't know of any study that actually tested these temperature cycling in the lab. And then there's a question to, well, really to everyone. Uh, but I mean, it's specifically on how dynamic is the gut microbiota in animals, but I think also other body parts. And is, I mean, are there shifts, sudden shifts observed in response to host factors such as hormonal cycles? How much do we know about? the dynamics uh, of the communities? I mean, <laughs> I should have presented all this because, um, but that is actually my second chapter of my dissertation is entirely focused on the gut microbiota and through fecal samples, of course. And we're seeing high, like, instability in within individual across their, across their lives and between individuals of the same matri line, so like the moms and the daughters, and be, like across generations and between, it's just, it's so different, but only when we're looking at like the composition of these communities. And we could, right, we, it's really hard to pinpoint exactly as to what, what's caught, what's driving these, but it, it, yeah, I'm looking at things like hormone, I'm looking at their age, I'm looking at the rank to sort of evaluate why, why are we seeing these differences. But if we do, if we look at like the metagenomes, then that tells us a, 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 it's telling us a different story. Um, I won't give too much away, but <laughs> it's telling us a different story. I think the gut microbiome is one of the main microbiome that in, um, 
change with the hormonal changes in the um, in the host. Um, but if we look at the respiratory microbiome, it's really highly stable, especially the upper respiratory tract, um, because it's something that constantly interacts with the environment rather than the host. So it's, I believe, basically where the host has upper hand in terms of controlling these host microbial interactions, that's probably as you see um, dynamic changes or temporal changes in the microbiome in response to changes in the uh, host, such as hormones like stress hormones, um, especially cortisol, um, the changes in those levels really um, reflected in the changes in gut microbiome. Yeah. Just on that, I, I want to suggest here a paper from Caporazo from 2016, Genome Biology. It's quite an awesome study. They uh, followed, I think, three human individuals over 15 months, collected 396 samples over this duration uh, to evaluate the gut, tongue, palm, left and right palm microbiota over time. and uh, if I understood it correctly, uh, they, they showed that what can one can consider as a core microbiota, which is present all the time, is actually extremely small. Depend, I mean, if you one considers about half of the samples need to have the specific uh, species, they say it's around 20% of the, the microbiota is, is stable over time in humans now. And of course, that has to, I mean, the question of using mice as models, and many of the studies are using male mice. And so, again, that is an, uh, something that's being recognized as well. Uh, actually, here was one question also to you, Julian. Uh, were the mice infected with other parasites during the outdoor exposure? Do you know if there were other things going, except in addition to the one parasite that you added? Um, in the specific study that I showed, there was actually one mice had one other uh, worm species present in their gut. So the mice were sacrificed at the end of the experiment, dissected and tested off the, the number of worms inside, and there was one other species there. Uh, and I think in the study I showed here, we didn't record any other parasites, but of course there are ticks and a lot of other pathogens out there that can then infect these animals. And this is actually a good point that we cannot control for that in this system. And okay. this might influence outcomes. And let's see, I have sorting through here. There's one more about colostrum feeding. Uh, so after this, farmers tend to feed them with calf starter, like other feeds, to introduce them to the feed gradually. Is it going to affect for more changes in the microbiota diversity showed with colostrum feeding? And if they want to continue the growth in beneficial microbiota, what are the recommended practices? Well, the calf striders definitely have, um, introduction of calf starter definitely has impact on gut microbiome and we do see the influence in the human microbiome not so much in the lower gastrointestinal tract but this is something that we are currently working on how we can um, maintain the bloom in bifidobacteria that we wanted to have in our gut or in our calves gut um, what we are trying to do is we're trying to understand whether because in the industry usually colostrum is spread during the first day and they were transferred to milk right after in the next day and we are trying to see if what, what happened like in the natural conditions we use a transition milk during between colostrum and milk and see how we maintain this classroom boost or uh, the the boost in bifidobacterium and the reduction in e coli through the neonatal period um, instead of switching drastically between diets because by switching the diet within one day we can achieve such a great change in the microbiome composition because it's changing the available nutrients for the uh, microbiota so 
right now our work we are trying to understand how we can use transition milk instead of milk straight from the second day onward and give them a little bit space for this gradual transition from classroom to milk and then we are also trying different bovine derived probiotics that we identify as supplementations to see if we can use um, bovine specific uh, probiotics groups to keep these uh, bacterial numbers higher, beneficial bacterial numbers at a higher level during the early life before they transfer into uh, calf starter diet. Because based on human studies, we know that cessation of the milk is the main cause for the um, microbial changes in uh, during early life. So that would be the same thing in um, dairy calves after weaning there will be a significant changes because these animals are completely relying on solid diet. So that, that's what we are doing right now. And there will be lots of really interesting things coming out pretty soon. Okay, thank you. Well, I think our time is up. So we're gonna have to wrap up this session. Again, I want to thank Neelu, Connie and Julian, uh, really fascinating talks. It's fun to see how the fundamental questions of ecology interface with practical animal husbandry and everything really in, in between. So thank you very much for taking time in this today. And thank you for everyone who's been in the audience. And just uh, a plug for future webinars. Uh, we're going to uh, discuss aquatic microbial ecology on October 15th and ecology of soil microorganisms on November 12th. So follow up, uh, take a look at the uh, website here for the links and uh, we'll also be sending reminders of these. And of course, if you missed our previous webinars, they're available also on the uh, OUP FEMS website. So you can go back at uh, either to the sponge microbiome, polar and alpine microbiology and antibiotic resistance. So again, thank you very much today and hope to see thank you. you soon again. Thank you, Max. Thank, thank you, you. Bye. everybody that thanks, thanks. Thank you.